And tonight, the Academy is proud to present the Gordon E. Sawyer Award to Jonathan Erland. First, let me say how astonished but deeply grateful I am to the SciTech Awards Committee, their chair, Ray Feeney, the Board of Governors, our President, John Bailey, for this recognition. And of course, none of this would have been possible without the love and support of the woman I love, my wife, Kay. and indeed my whole family. I don't think I could have known 34 years ago when I joined this institution just how significant it would become in my life. Early on, I holed up in our library, where I libra our librarian, Linda Mayer, who's with us this evening, provided me <laughs> with a trove of materials on the history of our institution. It was a revelation. It may come as a shock to some here this evening to realize that we are not created to put on a television show. <laughs> Even the very idea of awards was not a given. An early Board of Governors agenda contained the following discussion item. When, if at all, should we address the issue of awards? Our academy had far more pressing matters to confront. Dominating those matters was the science of cinema, so much so that our second president, William DeMille, presiding over a general meeting, was moved to respond to complaints about the emphasis of science over art by saying, if we don't get the science first, there ain't gonna be no art. <laughs> The 20s of the last century were indeed a time of great turmoil for the art science of cinema. Our fledgling academy waded into the chaos and in short order sorted out the basic raw material which made movies possible, light itself, by managing the transition from mercury to tungsten. Then it followed that by reducing the babble of disparate early sound systems to a functional one and even conducted a school to teach it. My study of our history was transformative for me, and the Academy mission increasingly became my mission. A lot happened in the succeeding century, and our art science has gone through many changes, but we're actually in much the same state of chaos today as ever, and DeMille's admonishment is as apt today as it ever was. The salient point is that our Academy was created to make art possible, to make the excellence of the art science of cinema possible. In turn, cinema can and does help make the world a better place and us better people in it. Our academy can take great pride in its contribution. However, in the middle of the last century, we became complicit in the blacklist, damaging people's lives and tarnishing our reputation. So I hope today we can stay focused on fostering the pursuit of excellence of cinema and let cinema itself be the agent of change in our society. A quick glance at the recipients over the last decade refutes This award is thought of by some as a career capper. A quick glance of the recipients of the last decade refutes that perception. My friends and colleagues here 
Gary Demos, Ray Feeney, Ed Catmull, Peter Anderson, and of course, Doug Trumbull, all remain very much still in the game. And in spite of being past my sell-by date, <laughs> I intend to work until I drop. The recent decades of my life were dominated by work that I did with colleagues and staff on the SciTech Council, especially Dan Sherlock and Joe DiGennaro and Scott Dyer, concerned with such issues basic to the cinema process as light and time. Light in the form of the quality of light produced by the newest instruments, including solid state LEDs, and time in the form of frame rates and the various techniques by which the cinematographer becomes the master of time itself. Since I termed out of the council, Kay and I formed the Pickfair Institute for Cinematic Studies, where we continue the work of expanding the cinema palette. In this, we collaborate with many colleagues, including Rajesh Ramachandran of Cube Cinema, Bill Schultz of Photochem, Noah Orozco, and Doug Trumbull, with whom I feel an almost fraternal relationship because we were both blessed with the experience of being mentored by his father, Don Trumbull, as were more than a few of the early Star Wars filmmakers. We hope also to collaborate with the Academy, as we do with the digital projection of Silent Films Project. The future bristles with technological challenges, such as virtual reality, which the Academy, as guardian of our past and guarantor of our future, recently acknowledged. Soon, we'll have self-illuminating screens and the prospect of orders of magnitude greater dynamic range in both image acquisition and display. The Academy's role as midwife in the adoption of new technology is needed as much as ever. I might have dreamed of this day when I, I began a career as an actor more than 60 years ago. Indeed, both Dame Judi Dench and Vanessa Redgrave, who were students with me at the Royal Central School, have been thus honored. But I certainly never dreamed I'd get here quite this way. <laughs> Forty years ago, a film I worked on won an Oscar for visual effects. One of the recipients of that first Star Wars Oscar was the late Grant McCune. Grant, the incredibly gracious Grant, loaned that Oscar to everyone on his team to keep at home for a week. Now, that was as close as I ever thought I would come to this. Reflecting for a moment on that original Star Wars film, this brings the cumulative total of Oscars to at least 32. That's just for the visual effects team, a tribute to John Dykstra's ability to pick talent. Over time, my career path swerved from in front of the camera to behind the camera. There were at least some, there were some rationale for this in that I also studied film at the London Film School. But if you think there's a significant difference between the science side of cinema and the artistic side, let me hasten to assert there really is none, or at least not as much as you might think. In cinema, art and science are bonded together and at a fundamental level, revelatory, and as such, enlightening. The same faculties, imagination, invention, insight, keen observation, and a talent for problem solving are the essential ingredients of performance in either case. Reviewing the list of my fellow Sawyer awardees, I find that there have been just 26 of us. That's an extraordinarily select group. Moreover, I find that I've known three quarters of them, many very well, and some like Lynn Dunn, Don Rogers, Petro Vlahos, Ed DiGiulio, Rod Ryan, and Tak Gashima, I count as my mentors and exemplars. It's a small community, stretching back for half my life, with scarcely a dozen of us still living, reminding me that our academy is not an edifice, though we have one, and a very fine one at that, nor is it an award show, though we have that too, and a wonderful extravaganza it is. An academy is, by definition, a body of academicians. That's flesh and blood people. Now more than 7,000 of us, 
an eclectic community of various perspectives, but imbued with a shared belief, ethos, and mission to foster the pursuit of excellence in the art science that is cinema, to cherish, to cherish, to cherish and defend that art science from rampant commoditization against incredible odds. Because as entertaining as we may be, and we do that wonderfully well as well, the ultimate goal and purpose of art is enlightenment. Indeed, this country and this art science both sprang from the age of enlightenment. And enlightenment is not a commodity. Now I need to beg your indulgence for just a couple of minutes longer for a, a coda, a postscript. Our early academy accomplished a great deal because our forebears really were the academy. There was then essentially no administration or staff. There were instead committees, many of them, and they collectively transformed early cinema. Over time, a growing administration comprised of non-members displaced academicians in many functions and operations of the institution. The academy became increasingly award-centric and members largely relegated to an award voting panel, a mere appendage of the academy. However, this community is comprised of much of the best practitioners in the field of cinema to waste the awesome, pre awesome potential of the resource is unconscionable. If we are to fulfill the dream that Fairbanks, Pickford, and the other founders had for our art form, we must collectively reassume more responsibility for our institution. Presently, we cannot even know who our fellows are, much less do we ever meet with them. My own branch, has managed just one meeting in recent years. No two branches have held a joint meeting in decades. So at this point, I'm going to turn the podium over to Mary Pickford's voice so she can make her own case. The Academy is the League of Nations of the motion picture industry. It is our open forum where all branches can meet and discuss constructive solutions to problems with which each is confronted. And in the past, we were never able to get together on a common ground and in making this possible, the Academy has provided, has conferred a great service. The producer, star, featured player, cinematographer, in fact, every individual can come into the Academy with any problem or proposal and feel that all barriers are leveled, that in this open court, his voice carries the same weight as that of any other person, regardless of position and standing. There is no greater force for coordination, no greater avenue for constructive and intelligent cooperation for advancement than that offered by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And, of course, my thanks to the Academy.
And there we are. Congratulations to Jonathan, and congratulations to all the awardees at tonight's ceremony, and to everyone who works so extraordinarily creatively in this industry. While I was listening to Jonathan, it occurred to me that another Englishman wrote something once which is perhaps appropriate for this event. He didn't know it would be, of course, because he lived 400 years ago. <laughs> but he wrote a little prologue at the end of A Midsummer Night's Dream. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if I have unlearned luck now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>